Please join me in the call to worship. So many memories come to us this weekend. So many lives to be remembered. In a world filled with violence and war, we gather, gather together, together to celebrate the promise of peace. In a world filled with tyranny and oppression, we gather, gather together, together to celebrate, celebrate the promise of justice. In a world filled with hunger and greed, we yeah, gather together, together, together to celebrate promise for all. for all. It is in this place that our hope springs anew. Our I hope is in the name, name of the Lord. Lord. Let's stand and sing together. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light 
that you will shine upon me. 13 dead at the municipal building, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Give to the departed eternal rest. That you will shine upon me. Four dead at the Gilroy Garland Festival, Gilroy, California. Give to the departed eternal rest. That my perpetual shine upon me. Let the light perpetual shine upon me. Ten dead at the Oregon District in downtown Dayton, Ohio. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine upon me. Eight dead on the road between the cities of Odessa and Midland, Texas. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine upon me. Five dead in that hall in Elk Pond, Alabama. Light perpetual shine on me. Four dead at a bar in Kansas City, Kansas. Give to the departed eternal rest. Light perpetual shine on me. Four dead at a backyard football watch party in Fresno, California. Give to the departed eternal rest. Light perpetual shine on me. Six dead at a cemetery in Kosher Market, New Jersey City, New Jersey. Departed eternal rest. The light perpetual shine upon me. Six dead at the Molson Tourist Complex in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Give to the departed eternal rest. The light perpetual shine upon me. Five dead at a convenience store in Springfield, Missouri. Give to the departed eternal rest. The light perpetual shine upon me. Five dead at the northeast side of Indianapolis. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Eight dead, three spies in Atlanta, Georgia. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Ten dead at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Shine on me. Six dead at the home in Washington, South Carolina. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let white perpetual shine on me. Four dead at a Norris complex in Kansas City, Charles County. Give to the departed eternal rest. Nine. Let white perpetual shine on me. Six dead at a home in South Carolina. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Nine dead at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis, Indiana. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Seven dead at a birthday party in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon me. Ten dead in a rail yard in San Jose, California. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. Four dead at Oxford High School in Austin Township, Michigan. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. Five dead in Lakewood, Indiana, Colorado. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. At the church in Sacramento, California, give the body eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. Six dead in downtown Sacramento, California, give to the party eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. Ten dead at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of perpetual shine upon me. All those who have died in any incident of gun violence, give to the departed eternal rest. 
Lord, let us bring our concerns and our thanks to God. Spirit surround us. In your name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. you to offer yourselves and your, your gifts to God through your offerings.
faith, the will, the thought. <clears throat> Lord, prompt us to action. And may these gifts that we do today serve for your kingdom, for bringing peace where there is war, for bringing uh, joy where there is heartbreak and sorrow, and Lord, to relieving pain that is so evident in this world. Take our gifts, bless them to your glory. And the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So with you. Let us share that peace with one another. from Matthew chapter 18 verses 6 through 9 and this is Jesus speaking actually I'm speaking but I'm speaking the words of Jesus <clears throat> anyway if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea <laughs> Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the hell of fire. Well, believe it or not, words of grace and words of peace.
Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So, um, yeah, the title of this sort of cherishing our children. If you were to rate your life experiences, top five or whatever, um, those, those things that resonate with you, that you remember, those experiences that are at the top of your list as being the most wonderful, what would, you, what would they be? Anybody, anybody. Birth of your children. You read my script. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, that's what I'm actually going into. I said, you know, near the top of my list would be holding my son James for the first time. I didn't give birth, so I couldn't have that experience. But I could. I remember holding him for the first time, and boy, I was. I didn't. I mean, I was kind of scared. It was exciting and scary at the same time. Am I going to break him? You know. I mean, it's like. So holding a Fabergé egg or, you know, something like that, I was afraid that the littlest thing would make him shatter all over the place. And I, you know, got him in the right angle doing all this, but it was just this exciting, wonderful, wonderful feeling that I, I just can't, it, it, words can't express it. Uh, and if you don't have children of your own, um, Nonetheless, you probably have had that kind of experience with a niece, a nephew, a cousin, just a friend's child or something like that. You hold the child um, and you are extremely cautious and you, uh, you know, you, you're, you're looking into those little eyes as they open and you, you know, you put on the goofy face and you're like smiling. And if you see him furrowing the brow and kind of like getting ready to cry, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. And you start acting goofier and bouncing around, doing whatever you can to keep his spirits up, keep those tears from falling out, you know. And, and it's just such a great, great feeling. You bend over awkward, backwards, liking, acting like a complete idiot just to keep that child happy. And you would do anything to keep that child happy and safe. And of course, babies aren't the only ones that we cherish. We, we, we cherish children as well, little boys, little girls. Uh, and I know, you know, I mean, I know that little girls may be much easier to like because little boys are made of snips and snails and puppy dog snails and little girls are sugar and spice and everything nice. So, you know, we, we, that's the truth about, you know, boys are kind of nasty that way, but little boys still have their charm, right? I mean, and if you're blessed enough to have a strong relationship with a child, uh, someone that, uh, a relationship that endures into adulthood, you know that you still cherish that person and that relationship, even as that person moves into adulthood. I, I had the pleasure of going out to lunch a few weeks ago with my son, with, one, with a couple of his high school friends that I knew from back when they were getting in trouble. I remember one of them broke our shower in our house, but, you know, it was like, but I remember, but you know, the, the relationship lasted and I kind of feel like a father to them when I'm around them. I'm very careful about, about you know, how I present myself and, and I, I, I really care about the decisions that they make and what they're doing. It's just, I, to me, they're still kids and I would, like to know that I had some uh, influence in directing their lives to, to doing good things to, so that they can enjoy what marriage is about. They can enjoy parenthood or grandparenthood for that matter. Um, the joy that comes from just having these relationships and uh, there's a joy of being a friend to someone as a, who's a child. You want to protect a child. Right, even as they transition from childhood to adult, even as they fall in love and get married, even as they have children of their own, and if anyone, anyone attempts to mislead that person, to take them down a dark path, to expose them to something evil, something deadly, something scary, you wouldn't hesitate to intervene you know, to say, shame on you, stop that, to, to, to whoever was, was misleading that child. You might, even, you might even use physical force to stop a person from hurting a child. And I dare say you would probably, you know, often give your own life to, to prevent that child from suffering any pain or any hurt. Well, in today's gospel lesson, Jesus is talking about children. 
And Jesus gives an extremely harsh warning to anyone who would cause a child to stumble. Jesus doesn't mince words. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones, it would be better for you to have a great millstone fastened around your neck and thrown into the sea. That's serious, that's serious consequences right there. And we have to ask ourselves as a people and as a nation, are we putting stumbling blocks for our little ones? And I would say, yes, we are. Yes, we are. It's horrendous enough to see children slaughtered, to imagine young lives unlived. How much joy they would have experienced how much could they have benefited humankind? All that was just cut off because of a troubled soul with an automatic weapon who really didn't have a whole lot of concern for his own life and didn't, obviously didn't have much concern for anybody else's as well. And we may not feel a lot of empathy for the perpetrator of a crime like this, um, but that person was a child once. And he could have known joy. He could have known love. He could have had enough faith to believe in his own future. But instead, he saw no value in his life and no value in the lives of the children around him. The great potential for joy and love is unrealized by so many. And of course, the children who are murdered are not the only victims of such a travesty. What about the living? What about those who are left behind? What about the parents whose lives in so many ways centered around their children? Their children are the reason that they go to work. They save their money. They scrounge. They spend extra time as, as den mothers or, or, or uh, troop leaders, chaperones, PTA presidents. Their lives have been centered around those children, and now that's just a hollow center in their lives. One thing you have to realize is that no parent ever gets over the death of their child. The memory stings every time it comes up. Some parents grow despondent, some grow depressed, some grow suicidal. Some do take their lives. They can no longer find meaning in their life when they lose such a precious thing as their own child. And what about the child's friends? The ones who used to play together with Alexandria Rubio, Jose Flores, McKenna Lee Elrod, or Javier Lopez. What are those friends feeling right now? Knowing that there will be no more play dates, no more laughing together, no more sleepovers, no more secrets that can share with one another. And if you add to this the sense of loneliness and trauma of seeing your friend die in terror, what kind of impression does that leave on a child's soul? And then there's the terror that comes from simply knowing that something like this can happen and does happen with far too much frequency. Why? So that those who want to own a gun can do so. Not just any gun, but a, a gun that can fire 10 rounds a second. A gun that can kill not bunches of birds or bunches of deer or bunches of moose or whatever. They're intended to kill bunches of people and to do it quickly. And we, as a society, continue to allow this to proliferate. And be, because of that, we've created a stumbling block of biblical proportions for our children. And Jesus has some choice words for us. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. And this is not a time to point fingers at others, my friends. Mass killings are a stumbling block for the whole culture, our whole society. I just outlined the irreparable emotional trauma that accompanies a mass shooting. It can't be quantified. 
You can't put a dollar amount on the cost of such violence in our midst, particularly violence that impacts young mm. children. And we as a society need to take responsibility for the decisions that we make that lead to such a long litany of horror that plague this nation. I'm sure most of you know what a millstone looks like. Some of them weigh up to about 3,000 pounds. And with each shooting, with each tragedy, I kind of feel that weight of this millstone around my neck is. I think my own inaction has allowed so much of this travesty to continue. I'm not a gun advocate, I'm not an NRA advocate, but I, I, I tend to sit back and complain, but not do some of the good legwork that needs to be done, that we all need to do. You know, um, we've, what have we done to prevent legislation that prohibits the sale of automatic weapons to the civilian pop, uh, from market and, uh, from passing in Congress? I haven't raised my voice in protest over those politicians who would support the proliferation of automatic weapons in this country in the name of profit, while at the same time cutting budget for mental health services that are uh, so necessary when you leave a traumatized community after a gun shoot shooting like this. I've fed into a culture of blame as well pointing my finger at my opponents and saying it's their fault while not doing all that I can to advocate and demonstrate and negotiate for change, lest this millstone carry this whole nation to the bottom of the sea. It's easy to feel yourself on the morally correct side of this issue, but casting the blame on the other side hasn't been very effective at dealing with the problem, has it? And perhaps Jesus recognizes this when he's talking about cutting off our arms or our legs or plucking out our eyes. I think Jesus is talking about compromise here. I'm not talking about just giving in to the wishes of the other side, but I'm saying taking steps that have to be taken to make incremental progress as opposed to no progress at all. Compromise is something that we struggle with as a nation, and mass shootings in this is, is a national problem. And clearly not enough has been done to end these shootings. It's time for this nation to lose an arm or lose a leg or an eye in order to save its very soul. What do I mean by this? I mean that we as a nation have to, first of all, engage with our political enemies people on the other side of our fence rather than just standing on our side and throwing stones over it. That in itself may feel difficult, like it's a difficult compromise to make for some, but we have to make it. And the other side has to make it as well. In a sense, each side on this gun control Second Amendment argument needs to cut off an arm or a leg or remove an eyeball or whatever. That's the way politics works. It's the art of the possible, not the ideal. The Bible speaks of the ideal many a times, and we all hold that as our vision in front of us. What the day when the sword is gonna be converted to a farming tool, when the lion can lay down with the lamb, that's what we Christians believe in, what we strive for, and oddly, there are Christians on the opposite side of the political fence from me who still believe that what they're doing is the Christian thing. I read an article yesterday from a manufacturer of automatic weapons who believes he's doing it for Jesus, making sure that there are enough automatic weapons available to arm every American who is afraid that his country will devolve into atheistic communism. He believes that. And he mourns for the children and teachers slain at Robb Elementary School, as I do. That should be embraced. That should be embraced. The fact that the other side mourns as well. They're not just evil standing there saying, 
But who cares about these kids? They mourn for it too. They need to understand, like our side needs to understand, we need to work towards something. We need to get something done here. That has to be understood. And the fact that they are Christians, that they identify as Christians, that's a door open to us. I know I'm guilty of it because I so often look at some Christians and I say, how the hell can they call themselves Christians? But they do. And that means that there's some point of connection between us that we can use to come together rather than just stand apart. Doesn't mean that we should not do other things. Certainly we should go out and fight against the proliferation of guns. We should work toward laws that prohibit the sale of automatic weapons. We should work toward universal background checks. We should use, do everything that we can to reduce this travesty, all in our power to end violence nationally and globally, to give children a safe world to grow up in rather than traumatizing them with endless warfare and random racially motivated massacres, because that is the kingdom for which we strive. The kingdom where love and peace are the order of the day, where no one makes hate speeches because no one hates. Where there is no fear mongering because no one lives in fear. And where lies are recognized for what they are, true lies. Right now it seems like children are the ones who are really the only ones working, not the only ones, but they're some of the main ones who are working for positive change in our society. Organizations like Students Demand Action and Every Town for Gun Safety were organized and, and prompted by kids who were victims, who, who were survivors of mass shootings in high schools. And they are working for change. They, are, they work to register people to vote, to stand up against gun violence and to vote in ways and to engage their congressional leaders, their national leaders and legislators to push for new laws that will diminish the risk of yet another slaughter. It's a strong indictment of the adult population when children are taking these matters into their hands. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, your paranoia leads you to believe that you need to bear arms, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet that would be thrown into the tree of fire. I don't think Jesus is talking about an afterlife fire. I think he's talking about a present world fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it away. It's better for you to go through life blind in one eye than to go into this, this hellacious pit where all we see is violence, destruction, mayhem, insanity, destruction. So my friends, I urge you, let us as a church, let us as a church engage, engage. Don't let this, don't let this tragedy be yet another one in the long wave, that long litany that we just read this morning. I wanted you to stand up on intentionally because I wanted you to feel it. I wanted you to feel it more. And I wanted you to know just how long that list goes. And every time another one comes, makes the headlines for a little while and then just kind of fades away. Let's not let this one fade. Let us do what we can in our power to support the children's organizations, the, the, the young adults who are lobbying, who are registering voters, who are calling their senators. Let us do that ourselves. Let us write letters. Let us do what we can to really get the message across. This, this cannot stand. Jesus speaks against it. We are a nation and we are responsible for one another. So let us come together to do what we can to fight this craziness. Let us pray. Lord, uh, I have no words. Uh, just that children are dying and their lives are being shattered by this mayhem. 
I pray, Lord, that uh, you would keep it fresh in our minds. You know, we've been reading in Richard Rohr how love and suffering go together. We love these children, and for that we suffer. We love this nation, and for that we suffer. Help us to grapple with this issue, with all of our strength, whatever we must do. We may have to compromise to get the ball rolling, but Lord, help us not to, not to put the ball down. Help us to keep that ball rolling until all dangerous weapons are kept out of the hands of those who would hurt others. May we not find our peace until that happens. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our, our closing hymn is Think of children who hear this song and think of what we teach them. That was when I, when I was uh, teaching Sunday school or leading Sunday school, I said, you know what? You don't have to teach them theology or anything. Just teach them that you love them and Jesus loves them. And that is the message that comes through this. So let us join in the closing. Jesus loves them.